Hello everyone! Hello. We are live on the internet. How are you guys doing out there on this evening? It's a great evening because it is System Shock's 25th anniversary. It's amazing. It's so good. And my name is Daniel from Night Dive Studios and I am joined by... I am joined with some very special people, actually, uh, tonight. Uh, I'm going to introduce them all. So we have with us uh, Warren Spector. Say hi, Warren. Hey there, this is me. <laughs> we have Tim. Hi, everyone. <laughs> we have Terry. Hello. <laughs> and we have Rob. He might be a little quiet. Oh, okay. We're working on it. Technical <laughs> difficulty. Oh, ooh, okay then. So yeah, I'm joined by all these wonderful people, and we're going to be doing a little playthrough of System Shock tonight, and we're going to have a gonna have a talk, gonna have some laughs. Um, so I'm just going to start off with some introductory stuff. So uh, Warren, if people are not familiar with uh, what you've worked on, would you like to give us some uh, kind of description of what you've uh, what you've been doing for the last twenty or so years? Uh, what have I done in twenty some years? Um, well, I've been making games since 1983. Uh, so, uh, I, I think I'm the oldest person still actively engaged in game development on the planet. Wow. Um, worked, uh, on a bunch of, uh, games at Origin, including Underworld and System Shock. Uh, and very briefly Thief with the, uh, the Looking Glass folks. On my own, uh, I was the creative director on, uh, Deus Ex. Uh, and then made the, uh, well-loved by me, uh, Disney Epic Mickey games. Disney. Uh, some some hardcore fans had a, a somewhat different view of that effort, but uh, <laughs> I was really proud of those games. Yeah, that's great. That's cool. Um, Tim, how are you, Tim? Would you like to give us a description of what you've been up to? Uh, sure. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, I was a designer primarily uh, on System Shock. Uh, among other things, did uh, a lot of work on the the engineering, medical, and uh, reactor levels. Uh, after that, um, I uh, was with Looking Glass for its whole history, really. I was lead designer on the Thief games. Uh, after Looking Glass uh, went away, uh, I did stints at various other places in the games industry, uh, primarily at uh, Vicarious Visions, which became an Activision studio, and at Harmonix, and now I'm with Other Side Entertainment. Yeah. That's very good. Thank you for that. Should have mentioned I'm with other side now too. This is Warren. <laughs> <laughs> really should have mentioned that. <laughs> Terry, hi Terry. Hello. Hi. Would um, you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Um, well, I'm the voice of Showdown, and um, so if my voice creeps you out, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I've also. Uh, been a designer at Looking Glass, uh, worked on levels, um, and I've, um, when Looking Glass went away, I've uh, done some writing for other games, including uh, the Thief games and um, Dishonored, and I continue to work with uh, Randy Smith a lot on uh, Waking Mars and uh, whatever his games, um, you know, that he'll do, I'll always work for him. and. I still get calls to do voice work, but when I did Shodan, you know, mostly they would just grab people in-house. Um, mm. uh, now, when there's a game, they hire big people, and I really can't compete, <laughs> um, you know, with the actors who are, um, you know, practicing their craft uh, all the time. Uh, so, anyway, that's me. I'm Terry. Mm -hmm. And I... I'm just uh, at home working uh, part time. <laughs> All right, Rob, are you uh, here with us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just yeah. fine. Okay. Hey. How are you doing? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would you uh, tell us a bit about um, what you've been uh, up to in the uh, in the industry? Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see, going through the history, started on System Shock, um, 
and then uh, let's see, um, thief, and then went on to um, irrational, and worked on the Freedom Force games, and then Bioshock, and then Bioshock Infinite, Lansing for the past five years. Ah, okay, very nice. And, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, we have Steve. Steve Kick here. Hey, Steve. Hey, Daniel. How's it going? <laughs> it's going pretty well, thank you. How about you? I'm doing so great. I am uh, just very grateful that uh, we we're able to have everybody um, join us tonight. This is a really big stream. Um, we haven't ever done this with so many guests before. And, uh, yeah, just thank you all for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. And we have thanks for having us. <laughs> and we have Callie as well. Sorry, Callie. Hi. I'm here. <laughs> you are. How are you? Good as per usual. I'm glad everyone's here. I'm also excited. <laughs> Do you want to talk a bit about what you've done? Or what I've done? They know what I've done. Well, I guess <laughs> our community knows. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here hanging out with you guys. We're going to get in the stream together with Steve. It's the best. Awesome. Right. Well. Without further ado, let's start the game. So uh, yeah, we're on, let's let's play the intro and uh, let's see what people have to say about uh, the wonderful intro in New uh, New Atlanta. Yeah, I have a I have a question for you before we get started. Oh yes, uh, this is Warren again. Are you are you going to be playing the uh, the CD version or the floppy disk version? CD. <laughs> the floppy disk version is the one that shipped on. Uh, September 23rd that was we can talk about that more that that was not the best decision I ever made in uh, in my career <laughs> right. yeah I mean I would love to hear the story behind that if uh, you didn't mind sharing uh, well uh, it was basically a business decision I was getting all sorts of pressure to uh, to ship the game and uh, <laughs> to fess up to floppy adventures. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm trying to read the scroll as it goes by, too. Anyway, there was just an awful lot of pressure. Uh, Origin was was typically on the uh, on the edge. Uh, and uh, we have been working on some very big, very expensive games and needed some revenue. And, you know, my job, I was kind of the B-movie guy to do the smaller games while Richard Garrett and Chris Roberts were doing the the mega million dollar, you know, swing for the fences, triple A crazy games that were either going to lose a ton of money or make a ton of money. And my job was to keep the lights on, basically. So, uh, which was cool because I could do whatever I wanted and nobody paid any attention except when they needed money. And in that case, September was the time we needed to ship a game. And I was the only one who had one that was close. So, December. <laughs> was when we shipped the, the CD version with all the voice and the, the high resolution and all that stuff, which is what we should have shipped in the first place. And I should have pushed back harder, to be honest. So, I, mean, I pushed back pretty hard. Say, you know, in, in fairness, at the time, like, that was just at the cusp of when, of when you know, there was wide availability of CD-ROM drives and stuff, which is something that's probably hard to imagine now. And so, you know, just the sheer impact of having the... the, the, the the, the elements of the game that that the CD version was able to give us, I think, was kind of hard to imagine. Actually, it's funny. I remember the first time we got a CD uh, at Origin, we all kind of crowded around it and held it up and looked at it like we were looking at the obelisk in 2001 or something, you know, and just, it's like, no one will ever fill this up. Sure enough, that, that lasted about three minutes. <laughs> I mean, we filled it up for crying out loud. <laughs> it's my favorite screen in the whole game. The <laughs> help screen that obscures every bit of the screen. <laughs> Had to use every key on the keyboard, you know? <laughs> I remember uh, reading an article about uh, like the advent of CD-ROM and it seemed like um, the game that really pushed it to like the must-have peripheral was uh, the seventh guest, believe it or not. Mm. Oh yeah, that was huge. Seventh guest and then missed. Missed was uh, was pretty important too. 
Very oh, true. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca yeah. Lessing. It's, um, yeah. I remember everybody's the, favorite. The CD ROM that we got first was, uh, I think like a 4X or maybe even a 2X speed CD ROM drive. Hey, Tim, did you build this part of the, the level? I don't remember. I don't remember who did this part. It might have been. That's interesting. Uh, we we zip past the uh, the intro sequence, but uh, just earlier today, I was looking back at some of the old System Shock stuff I've got. Us, uh, the the original, the very first write up uh, of the the description of the story, uh, which I suspect uh, Austin Grossman wrote. I don't remember who wrote that exact uh, document, but it was pretty much exactly what actually made it to the screen. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. Is that, that's Ned Lerner. That was the co-founder of Looking Glass. Yeah, yeah. The the, the uh, base actor for uh, for Edward D. Yeah, Austin did 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 the vast majority of the the, the story work on, on System Shock. So uh, um, any, any particular piece. I remember him arguing for uh, a female protagonist and getting nowhere and uh, at least settling for uh, a, a, a female antagonist. I guess that was to, Oh, look at that. Four, five, one, go figure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whose idea was it to have the, uh, the difficulty system be kind of modular, like being able to choose the, like the difficulty of the various um, mechanics of the game, that type of thing. Honestly, don't remember. If I were a betting man, I'd say it was Doug, Doug Church. Yeah, I want to say that was. But I honestly don't remember. Yeah, it's been something that we've been looking at a lot um, because you know there's a lot of different gamers out there with a lot of different expectations of what they want from their game, and you know you've got people who play Dark Souls that want an easy mode, um, and it's kind of an interesting. Um, like sub mechanic almost that you don't really see in a lot of games these days with the ability to, you know, turn off the enemy AI or just create some kind of um, customized experience for the player. It was, it, it really did work very, very well. There's no question. Uh, it's interesting though. It was very meta, I guess, in the way it was done here. And I think in later games, uh, like Thief and, and uh, certainly Deus Ex, I know I was thinking about it, that uh, the game should just tune itself to the way you're playing. You're around shooting a bunch of stuff. There, more stuff to shoot shows up. Uh, and um, I'm not sure that was even possible uh, in 1994. I mean, in this, this game got started probably in 1992. Wow. And shipped about two years later. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. amazing. Correct me if I'm wrong. The uh, the code name was uh, Junction Point. Is that right? No, oh, no, no. Junction Point came way late. Oh my gosh, you don't want to go off on that tangent. <laughs> um, no, Junction Point was uh, uh, was something that I was working on at Looking Glass Austin years later. Um, trying to keep quiet about that because I don't want you know Disney to get upset with me that. Uh, that I, I was working on Junction Point before I created a studio named Junction Point. But uh, no, actually, the, the I feel like I should shut up and let other people talk. Um, but I'm, I'm a talker. I can't help it. Uh, this all got started. We're, was, we're relying um, on you to carry this. <laughs> I don't really want to talk. <laughs> OK, well, I'm just going to keep talking then. Um, <laughs> No, there was after Underworld Two. Remember, I was I was gonna have to kill myself if I had to make another game with a a guy wearing plate armor, you know, swinging a big sword. <laughs> and uh, as it turned out, uh, Doug and Paul uh, Paul Nurath were having the same kind of feeling at uh, at Looking Glass, 
And there was a, a point where Doug was in my office. He came down to Texas, and we were we were just talking about how we never wanted to make another fantasy game as long as we live. Uh, and I kind of got over that. But so uh, he was working on. He and Paul, I guess, were working on. Uh, Tim, you'd probably know better than I do, but that the, there was uh, a thing called Steel Citadel going on at, at Looking Glass in its early stages, and. I was working on something called Alien Commander. Basically, Underworld in using the Wing Commander set in the Wing Commander universe. Uh, and, and and realized that it was stupid to have two games like that going at the same time. Uh, and, and so uh, Alien Commander completely uh, although I still have some early documents on that, which are kind of amusing. They're they're way worse than System Shock. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm glad uh, I'm glad I shelved that, and the, the Looking Glass guys got to make System Shock for sure. Yeah, I don't remember much about the, the Steel Citadel concept, except that it was a thing. But obviously, the the name survived in. in... Um, Rob, I got a question for you. Um, did you have a? I, I know you did a lot of the textures and um, just you know the vast majority of the artwork here. But um, did you have a hand in designing cyberspace? And and if so, what was your? Uh, what was kind of your inspiration for that? <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I didn't design the, you know, the actual look or space of it. Um, I just did the. Uh, a number of the uh, um, sort of cyber enemies, um, which were just you know simple um, abstract sort of objects, and then the um, I think the the thing um, for cyberspace that I, that I had to put a little bit more thought into, but it you know in the end it still wasn't quite exactly what I was looking for, but it. Um, I just did what I could at the time, but the um, the the way Shodan was represented, you know, I wanted to be some some sort of like weird um, <clears throat> abstract like um, you know personification of Shodan that you know that would be unexpected and just you know abstract and I, I really was like a huge fan of Hellraiser at the time and. Always like um, the representation of uh, Leviathan, and you know their their god there and how and it was just the sort of um, you know what shape you call that. It's just sort of a stretched like um, sort of crystal thing that emanated this black sort of light, um, like a um, like a lighthouse almost. And so that was that and then a combination of tron was was sort of how i came up with the um with the look of shodan for for cyberspace you know just sort of this weird um you know sort of abstract shape with a sort of you know these crabby um uh arm sort of thing so but yeah that's that's basically it I mean, for for me for cyberspace that's funny. I'm I'm watching the feed here, and it's making me so incredibly happy that I see you leaning around corners a lot. <laughs> we were the we were the first damn game to do that, and uh, I remember uh, I was uh, you know I was with Doug at a place called the Texas Chili Parlor here in Austin. Just started going off on why can't you lean in games? Why can't you lean? <laughs> and we started, we started like leaning at the table. I'm sure everybody thought we were nuts, <laughs> but uh, it it's um, it, it caused a lot of trouble actually. I, I remember I, I went to a um, a game convention called uh, Gen Con, and I was showing this uh, System Shock will remain nameless Cyber Mage. Um, <laughs> which was really, really simple relative to System Shock. Uh, but it was a first-person science fiction game, kind of cyberpunk fantasy stuff. And I remember watching uh, a five-year-old kid 
hand on a on the joystick and and having a great old time with uh with cyber mage and then turned around and looked at system shock and saw grown men um stuck crouched leaning in a corner able to stand up or turn around or anything it was very frustrating because here's this this game that i thought was just marvelous uh and thing was was kind of problematic i, I should probably shouldn't be saying stuff like this everything was perfect in system shock <laughs> Yeah, it was wonderful when um, when Paul, I guess he dug through his archives or maybe it was his closet, who knows. But uh, when he gave us the, the Mac source code for System Shock and um, we had employed um, one of the modders who had somehow through some dark magic implemented mouse look into um, the original System Shock and we gave him the code and he you know, implemented the mouse look and a bunch of other fixes. And we all started playing and we're like, wow, this is like a modern game. And all we had to do was add in the ability to just kind of look around. It's, yeah, it's, it's funny, it's really you know, I... Oh, just the saying, like, hey. that was... It's such a standard now that, again, like, it's a little hard to imagine what it was like, you know, before... Mouse look had really been invented, and and everyone was trying to figure out from scratch like how to support that. Um, I mean, even being able to look up and down at all was you know relatively novel. Somebody somebody asked a question: Was this the Underworld engine, or was it all new? And it, this was a new engine uh, that that gave you much more three dimensionality uh, than than Underworld did. Underworld was was kind of limited in that way but uh you know on mouse look i just remember uh the first game i saw that had mouse look was what was it terminator 20 something i can't remember get that thinking ah oh, it's a fad it's gonna go away no one no one's gonna want to do this mouse look thing <laughs> it was completely wrong <laughs> The Terminator Future Shock, somebody just said that. Terminator 2029, I think that was it. Is it 2029? I think it was. There was a whole Whichever one, it was some Terminator game. Yeah, that's really the right time. That was, it was came out the same year. Oh, but that was Bethesda. I forgot that was. Bethesda. Uh, so I have like a whole bunch of questions from the community, and I don't know if we'll be able to get through all of them. But uh, I would like to pepper them in from time to time. But speaking of pepper, this has to do with salt. Um, <laughs> this question from Mickey Wilson uh, says, is the salt, is the salt a fry story true? The rumor is that the dev studio cut out sections of a fry box for McDonald's and said, salt the fries and put them all over the office because the team thought it was funny. But I'd like to hear the whole story if possible. Thanks. I think I think the number of, of, uh, of boxes has been embellished in the retelling. Um, <laughs> But that's 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 more or less it. Like the, the thing is, like you know, we surprisingly we pulled a certain number of all-nighters when we were working on System Shock, uh, and the only place near the offices uh, that was that was open all night was McDonald's. So people would go and do these food runs, and you know, come back with they they give us the, the the boxes that their supplies had come in to carry the carry the food orders back, and and. And you know, one of them, like the, the the frozen French fries, had come from the distributor, right? And and there's this reminder on the box: don't forget to quote salt the fries, unquote. You know, like the way people like use quotes for emphasis, even though that's you know. But okay, so it's wrong, whatever. But this this particular thing just made it made it look funny because like making that a quote, it's like okay, what notable person once like first said salt the fries, right? And, <laughs> 
Plus, you know, since we were pulling all nighters, everything was funnier at the time, right? What well, weren't there boxes that that had like mutant? Oh, boxes? yeah, right. So the the other the other thing that 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 made that stick with us, I don't know, like in a way that like McDonald's would never would never pass for like anything the customers were going to see. Like these supply boxes, like had the McDonald's logo on them. You know the the, the 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 M in the shape of two arches, except it, it was wrong. It was it was three arches, <laughs> which isn't even a thing, and that that just made it all even more surreal. But there were there were definitely some all nighters. I remember, uh, you know, bug meetings at eleven o'clock at night and two in the morning and stuff. Those were always fun too, and then. Tim, you remember there was this brown thing, <laughs> this this couch-like thing. Oh, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It was like the zero gravity thing, that comfortable, and lots of people would sleep on it. I, I it always oh, freaked I, I me out. Though. A lot on that couch. couch was because I I always wondered, you know, whose like skin follicles and stuff were in there, and Ugh. it was it was disgusting. But it was so uh, comfortable, man. It was. Great. I think Rob told me about this couch. It's got, it's, a, <laughs> it's got a history. Yeah, it, well, imagine probably more shag. than you want to know. I'm coming into the office in the morning, and where we worked in the art pit, there was, um, you know, we were just sort of always a little bit expanding. So there was like some cubicles that weren't set up, um, but we were like sort of in this area that had more space in the back and then just some like cubicle walls like set up um on the one end and so i'd come in in the morning and then like out of nowhere you know like mark leblanc or someone would like you know come out from behind this cubicle like you know like he just woke up you know from the sleeping bag because they had spent the night there <laughs> Wow. I remember opening up, opening drawers in people's desks and seeing like six paychecks uncashed. And I mean, people worked really hard. You know, people often ask me, what's what's the thing I remember the most about System Shock? And it's it's that team. I mean, I, I haven't worked with a lot of teams that been great so much, so badly uh, and would do absolutely anything uh, to make it happen. A hard-working team, no doubt about it. Yeah, no, another thing that, that brings to mind, um, and we've told this story before, I'm sure, but um, there's the there's this uh, there's this puzzle in System Shock, right, where you have to get by a retina scan. Uh, and spoilers, that's what the severed heads are for. I mean, the severed heads were in the game be before the puzzle. <laughs> But you have to like find the person who was authorized for this retina scan and find their find their severed head to bring to the bring to this this door, um, and that that actually was a gag that like Mark LeBlanc and I came up with like at at five in the morning and no we weren't getting up early we were driving home, <laughs> um, and uh, I don't remember how 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 we thought of it but I remember when we thought. Of it. That sounds just it's game funny. design gold right there. That's become a trope in like science fiction movies now too, hasn't it? There's always, always ripping us off, you know. They're they're, they're, they're tearing heads. eyes out of people's heads or uh, cutting off hands and you know using them to use the fingerprint scanner or whatever. Or like, you're like you won't hurt me. You need me to operate the retina scan. No, I just need your eye. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in that? Get out the melon baller. <laughs> it was la the but it was really disturbing scene. It, it, do you remember whose head it was? There was one in particular. I can't remember. Was it, was it John Mayara's head? Or, I, I want to say it was John Mayara, yeah. Yeah, one of the one, a programmer. So many team members in the game. It's like I, I think everybody I think was in the game. I did all those, I did all those heads. <laughs> did you really? Yeah. Those are so funny. No, I think I think anyone who wasn't in the game in a speaking role was, was at least present as a separate. Online. 
Carly, do you want to ask a couple more questions? Oh, yeah. I was just about to say, are you guys ready for a few more questions? Because I have one yeah. for Warren. Um, oh. This one's from Nova on our uh, Discord. They're asking, would you like to have been more involved in some System Shock 2 back in the day? If it didn't have clashed with uh, Deus Ex? Uh, well, until that last part, I was going to say it it clashed with Deus Ex. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it really wasn't possible, but, um, honestly, you know, I, the game turned out so well, I don't know what I could have added to it. Um, probably not. Uh, you know, it, it Ken and Rob Fermier and, and all the folks on that team, uh, they knew what they were doing. Um, and, and also, you know, to be honest, it, it got a little more role playing, And, uh, you know, System Shock, I think one of its real strengths is that it doesn't play uh, to the, the standard role-playing tropes. I mean, it's in the world and, and nothing would, would drag you out of that world. And I always felt like, I mean, I've said this a thousand times before and I'll probably say it a thousand times again, but, you know, it, we, have, we have better tools to you being in a world than character classes and secret die rolls and all of that stuff. Um, and so I, I don't really see much of a point in recreating the, the tropes of Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, System Shock 2 moved pretty far in that direction. So it was, I, I probably would have been fighting with that team a lot and that wouldn't have helped anybody. I mean, System Shock 2 ended up being uh, a terrific game and I probably would have just screwed it up. Aww. Yeah, I would. I would also say, like, for my part, um, like System Shock Two was the first Looking Glass adventure game that I got to play without having worked on it, which is a very different experience. And it was delightful. I guess you do have to think about that too, because you didn't necessarily work on it. You get to enjoy. It. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. People ask me about you know how I feel about the the Deus Ex games that uh, IDOS Montreal made. And that's pretty much what I always tell them, and it's true. I, this game, without knowing all the secrets, it's uh, it's it's pretty swell, actually. Um, I do have a question for Rob now. Uh, this question comes from our mod, uh, Deep Chrome, who's actually helping me put together the questions. Uh, here it goes. What can you tell us about the visual development of some of the classic shock enemies like the Elite Cyborg and the Cortex Reavers? Like what ideas did they start from and how did they develop to what they are now? Um, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, let's see, the Elite Cyborg, that was the first character um, I did for System Shock. Um, and um, I, I actually don't, I mean, <clears throat> I just sort of um, was sketching this thing out and, you know, just the sort of basic inspiration was um, just kind of came from like, um, like heavy metal magazine, you know, I guess that would account for somewhat of the, you know, scantily clad <laughs> um, to him. Um, and, um, yeah, and then and then also obviously just you know a little bit of the um, Star Trek Borg, um, and yeah, I don't know. I I I think I just like I was just so excited to like try to try to make a a character that you know I just kind of <laughs> you know um, just sort of went by the seat of my pants and you know um, that guy came out and. For the Cortex Reaver, um, I remember specifically, um, you know, the quest was for, um, you know, I mean, it was called the Cortex Reaver, but the request specifically was for a, uh, more or less, a, you know, a brain in a jar with, with some legs. It was supposed to be sort of a little spidery creature. Um, and again, I just, um, I, don't, I don't know, I just, I kind of had seen that before and I just sort of really locked on to the idea of somehow um, 
the cyborg using, you know, not just it not being as neat as like, you know, separating, separating the brain from the body. So in, instead, like incorporating like the entire bodies to where it's just sort of this like, you know, flaccid sort of, you know, uh, appendage to it that is almost like, um, you know, it's it more so becomes obvious that the the mechanical uh, robot is sort of like feeding on this um, on the full sort of he's still tapping into the brain but but you just you know it's just not quite as neat and you have the more visceral sort of um, representation of you know what's happening as far as the machine using this this thing and and I remember I remember the the feedback on it was like people generally because it was definitely not what people expected and so there was there was definitely a like resistance to it um but in the end like there it there wasn't like you know I don't know we got away with so much stuff as artists like we could kind of just do whatever we wanted to do and we weren't really you know we didn't really have to like um, bend too much to, you know, to changes or whatnot. We just kind of did what we did and it got put in. Um, so that's how that ended up in there. And the, the Cortex Reaver is making a comeback in System Shock 3, I guarantee you. It's a, a great, that was a great character design. Mm. I love the Cortex Reaver. Yeah, it's... might not. You might not when we get done with you. <laughs> oh god, that makes it even better. It's one of my favorite enemies in the game. I will admit, it's just it's once you see it, it's just everyone. like I'll never ever forget what that looks like ever. And I'm being shot while I'm talking. Oh, good. I mean, it was disappointing too because you know I had to like crunch that you know that model, the 3D model I made into like a 128 you know, by 128 texture. So it, you know, it was really small and it just, you know, and the reason I actually ripped them off at the, at the waistline, because, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't fit the entire body, you know, cause he was concepted with the entire body, but in the end I ripped him at the waist because it was just so small. Like I couldn't, you know, get the whole body in there. Um, and so that's why at the end, uh, or, you know, I, I just sort of wanted to like um, show the thing uh, more clearly. So I um, came up with that like death and game cutscene. I just did that on my own accord and um, just said, I, you know, why don't we use this for the, you know, like the death cutscene and um, and the, so that ended up just sticking as well. Uh, yeah, but that's that's the only sort of real sort of clear, I think, visual because the the pixelated version is just it just kind of looks like a mess. All right. Well, I actually do have a question for Terry, if you're ready. I think I'm ready. <laughs> uh, this one's from Valet 2 from Discord, I believe. Um, Valet asks, uh, did you know what was originally planned by Ken Levine for the ending of System Shock 2? Um, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not in the least. And um, in fact, a lot of the voice acting I've done for um, System Shock 2 or almost all the voice acting I've ever done for games right at the last minute sometimes they'll set up the voice recording date without having a script ready um, and so um, I'm sure that I did the voice recording for System Shock 2 over several um, sessions and uh, I probably didn't learn any of my final lines until the the last session so um you know with some spoilers i knew a little bit about what was going on um in system shock 2 but you know i, I wasn't 
fully informed or anything. <laughs> does that answer the question? I'm not sure. I think it does. It was a surprise. Yeah, it was. Which sometimes is an interesting thing to do. <laughs> I am one thing we should in our list now. Oops. Oh, sorry. Continue. Should all have a moment of silence for the elevator music. Uh, <laughs> well, I get bludgeoned. The elevator it. music. I just about fell on the floor. It was perfect. And this scene right here, man. That's when the when all those mutants like attack you right outside the elevator. That scared the well scared the pants off. Of me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's me. I did. A, I pulled a lot of cruel practical jokes in the player where I would, where I'd pull ambushes just when I thought that they. Thought... Typically, there's a there's a place of safety outside the elevator, but uh, thank you very much, Tim, for, you know, <laughs> that little ambush there. Much appreciated. Turn the lights back on. That you can turn the lights on and off was a little miracle. <laughs> I like how um, space, when you look out of a viewport, isn't a uh, kind of like a flat texture on a on a block somewhere. It's actually, if you stand there and watch the stars, they do move very slowly across the screen. I do like that. Yeah, I, I did too when it came in at the very last freaking minute. <laughs> Wait for new features to be going in. Uh, I remember that, and and uh, like the the camera started moving, very last minute, and I got really mad. I I I gave. Uh, let's just say I gave some folks a hard time about that, and then I went into my office and I did a little happy dance because it <laughs> it was exactly the kind of thing. I mean, that team wanted to make the game great so much. It was risky and probably crazy to to do that kind of stuff. I think that was that was James who did that. James Fleming, I think. Yeah, that was maybe. James Fleming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, way too risky to do that late, but it just you know little things like that made the game so much more immersive and so much better. Is it true? I remember I remember the story um, that. So Harvey, Harvey Smith was actually was actually the the lead playtester down in the origin end on this project, if I remember correctly. Yes, and, he was. Uh, and when uh, when the when the moving starfield went in, I understand he he trolled you by claiming that there was a Kilrathi fighter out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was he. He was one of the people I gave a hard time to, and it wasn't even his fault. He was he was just there at two in the morning that day, you know. It was crazy how late that happened. Anyway, it was it was nuts. That's you, you can't get away with that kind of stuff anymore. I mean, the the and the risks are so great, and you know, games. That's it's always been that way. But back then, we were, you know, we were just making it up as we went along. Does that include the uh, roller skates? <laughs> I always thought the roller skates were dumb. <laughs> <laughs> the roller skates are the best way to get around this game. I'm not kidding. It's so <laughs> much fun. Skate or die, man. Skate or die. It is yeah, so the... much fun. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I... to each his own, I guess. I think those may have may have been an outgrowth of the uh, of the ice levels in, in Ultima Underworld 2. <laughs> Makes sense. Are we going to show the uh, the concept art that Rob did of the new roller skate roller blades next month, Carly? Uh, I Sp hope to be sharing it. <laughs> they have a very Jet Set Radio grind well. feel to them. They're great. Also, sorry, my mic is a little bit garbly. I need to get a new one. And I am reading ahead on our question, so be prepared in just a moment for more.
you know, I'm, I'm looking at all these comments in the in the, the feed here, and I, I I better use the elevator music, and I better quick figure out how to do roller skates in uh, in System Shock Three. <laughs> <laughs> Without the roller skates, you, would, you wouldn't have had Dorian's ski jump cap. <laughs> <laughs> nice Remember jump. that? Nice jump. Yeah, tell it. I have um, kind of a slightly open-ended question uh, from Dracostar from our Discord. Uh, and this is for anyone to jump in. Uh, from your own point of view, how does it feel to have seen such a massive advancement in gaming over the years leading to now? Specifically when you look back through your childhood and your game, like your personal gaming and your own development. Wow. You dropped out there. I didn't hear the last oh, part of the question. Oh, I dropped question. out? No. I'm no. so sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, uh, I'll, I can repeat the question. It's a bit open-ended and long. Um, from your own point of view, how does it feel to have seen such a massive advancement in gaming over the years leading up until now? Specifically, when you look back on your own childhood of gaming and your own development through the years. I mean, everything's changed. It's pretty incredible. If you had told me the way things were going to be now back in 1994 I would have said you were crazy um, you know I think the in some ways it was it was kind of cool that we had such low fidelity graphics and fidelity music and low fidelity everything because it, it forced you to use your imagination I think a little bit more now things are realistic uh, that it's it's sometimes a little bit less of uh, dependent on uh, player imagination but uh and costs have gone up so dramatically and you need i mean i uh, on the last game i did i had 800 people working on it Oof, wow. remember correctly oh, wow. the, the whole team on on system shock was probably what 20 25 maybe maybe even that was a big team back then uh so you know developments changed the stakes are a lot higher and it, it's almost like games are a solved problem now in a way uh whereas in the system shock days we really were making it up i mean nobody knew what they were doing oh yeah it was, no, it was I, kind of a crazy frontier which was fun yeah i i i recently had the the realization that that uh that system shock was was closer to in history to Pong than we are to System Shock now, and I'm not sure how to feel about that. Wow, I wish you hadn't said that. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting what you said about, you know, how everything was lower fidelity and it kind of left you room to imagine things. And um, we run into that a lot um, with like our core night dive team when we go back and restore a, an older game because everybody that played it when it first came out has a different vision of what it was um, versus what it what it is now. Um, and so that's, that's interesting because, you know, what we're trying to do with our System Shock remake is basically make, <laughs> make the version of the game that you remember playing back in 1994. And so um, it's, it's very difficult um, because everybody you know, kind of imagine things a little bit different. Um, but also, like you said, the, the, there's, there's nothing that we really can't do or haven't figured out yet in terms of, you know, um, at least standard game design and mechanics. Go, like, oh, we want to do dismemberment. We want to do broken glass. We want to add in all this stuff. It's fairly well documented, or there's somebody that you can bring on that's done it before and, um, there's not as much problem solving as there as there used to be, which you know kind of led to the the innovation that really drove uh, the industry back then. 
that's true and you know you said something really interesting there about uh well the, the way i put it is you know you you're competing on system shock 3 is the same thing i mean we're competing not with the game system shock but people's memory of it that's that's mm. a big challenge it's it's really hard In my, talents, I shape Craig. my favorite audio of this one I have a question for Warren. Um, if you were to go back in time and work on uh, System Shock again, would you make any changes to the game at all? Wow, uh, that, that's a really tough question. I bet. <laughs> You know, I I don't I don't know. I, I Tim and Rob and, and Terry might have a different answer. I I don't tend to look back very much. Um, you know, there's there's always the next game. I, I don't I don't know. I'll have to think about that. Someone else answer that. Well, I would change the user interface, but not much. <laughs> I wasn't officially on the team i was hired separately and and i'm also like warren i don't i tend not to look back i once i finish a project i need to look forward um whether that's you know musical or in the game industry i i leave it so that i've got enough brain space for the next project coming up that makes sense I had, if I had one do-over, not me. <laughs> I had, that's that's my phone. Sorry. Project. It's really not a good time. No. <laughs> okay, to... class. Rob's gonna answer the phone, and no. we're gonna listen. No, no, no. You have Shodan answer the phone. <laughs> God, that would be awesome. <laughs> do pathetic insects realize you're calling while we're in the middle of a stream? <laughs> the worst possible time i would i would change the ui the 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 ui ux was was not high on our uh, our list of things we understood that would that would be it my do over would be the um i wish is that the I phone had... call you just got <laughs> well, at the last sort of minute um on the uh on the last level, the um, the bridge, I somehow like decided to um, sort of pep it up by adding all that sort of Giger-esque bio infestation. <laughs> and I, I just wish at the time the art director would have just like cracked crack my knuckles or something. Cause you know, I, I just wanted to the last level to sort of feel different from the other levels like have it be spookier or cooler or something and so you know I was a huge gear fan and you know and I made up a bunch of these textures and put them in and you know textured it myself you know trying to like get it to look decent enough but still in the end it just like you know it just looked like a pixelated mess you and... talking about the the black and white stuff I loved that I, did. Did. I think there's a lot to love about that. I absolutely it's, loved it. I I totally see like where the the thing that you were trying to pull up to pull off, you know, was hard to realize, especially given you know the limitations of the engine. Uh, but but yeah, I agree. There's a lot to love about. I think you're just being uh, the, hard on yourself. I've, I, yeah, I've always just been embarrassed. Yeah, about the it. thing I loved we about it, it was all are hard on ourselves. This may come across as a backhanded compliment, but. It, it's the it was so pixelated pixely that it it kind of swam around and it looked alive to me i always i i loved it i thought you did a great job <laughs> whose head was that it almost looked like um jonathan davis from corn <laughs> I think that was, I did a pass on a Sarah Verrilli. <laughs> I was, I was going to say it was Sarah. I think, I think.
Um, I she have was, a funny. She was the oh. tester, right? Sarah. Sarah was one of the testers over. Yeah, she was. Uh, she was our lead on the on the looking glass side. She was. Yeah. She was Harvey's top. She ended up at at MIT, right? And in, in their one of their game divisions. Oh yeah, she's she's now uh, and has for some time been uh, been an instructor at MIT at the MIT. This this brings up another interesting point. We um, we had Mark uh, join us on the 20th anniversary stream for Shock Two a couple weeks back, and um, one of the things that kept coming up was the the diverse background of everybody that worked at Origin and Looking Glass and Irrational. It seemed like you know obviously back then you couldn't get a degree in game design or anything like that, but um, you know you had multiple um you know mit grads uh you had some phds um you had some geniuses working at the, at these companies um and i was curious like what you know anybody what your opinion might be on just trying to hire up more people from more diverse backgrounds to get um you know some fresh blood or some fresh ideas into into the game development scene One of the things I, I loved about Looking Glass was it had this kind of MIT culture, I guess. And, and like, I, I don't know, I was really energized by it. I remember uh, back in the underworld days, I lived in, in uh, Deco Morano, the house of 10 dumb guys, right? And I, the first time I visited that place, I walked in three minutes realized I was the stupidest person in the room <laughs> and it was it was amazing it was such an amazing experience I mean to talk about smart people holy cow I got that whenever Thank I was in the so you're not you're aware it's it's it's, it's funny I, I've probably told this story before too but actually uh Doug was my first roommate at MIT like during freshman orientation week when they're just like randomly were putting people in rooms together i happened to end up getting bunked with doug it was super intimidating because he like had so many more opportunities in high school than i had and he was like he's like way ahead of me already and i was like, going to my team like, this is my first experience of like i feel like so i want to um take a brief moment here to make a, a small announcement oh yeah and that is um we have, as you may know, uh, partnered with Limited Run, and we're going to be re-releasing a big box collector's edition of the original System Shock, uh, featuring all new artwork on the box from Rob Waters. Thank you again, Rob. Um, there's going to be just a, a mass of just wonderful things in there. and. Um, yeah, Daniel, if you want to show a picture, we've got a uh, concept of the box, but we're going to keep the the stuff that we're including kind of a secret until um, October 1st, which uh, is when it will go on pre-order. Um, and we're also releasing the original soundtrack um, that's been remastered on vinyl, on a double vinyl, on um, translucent green vinyl with, again, all new artwork by Rob Waters. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> and uh it should be really awesome to to see some system shock stuff out there again can you guys see that on the screen let me go look <laughs> i have a little bit of a delay how how do i get one you know a guy right <laughs> I oh guess. i know a guy and no, I don't see it on your screen, Daniel. Mm -hmm. You might have to uh, go into your editor. But I did link the tweet. I will link the tweet again. Oh, boy. I'm not sure how I get to the editor from here. I just linked the tweet from Limited Run uh, uh. in the chat, and I'll keep linking it so people can see. Nice. Really there. 
And uh, those who have joined our Discord, which I also keep posting that link up, I put it in our announcements channel so you can see the image there as well. Oh, there we go. I think I got it. <laughs> Hopefully that should be on the screen. Oh, yeah, there it is. Oh, yeah, and there's the vinyl. Yeah, the vinyl is a double LP with a gatefold with um, all new artwork. It's just, it's really beautiful. Yeah, cool. well, which one? That's the, uh, that was my little interruption, so. <laughs> <laughs> Do want, I will admit. Awesome, so exciting. Nice. All right. Oh, I see. Shall we continue? I, I just uh, I just saw uh, on Twitter that someone re someone replied to Night Dive to your um, your tweet about the about the stream tonight. They uh, they have a picture of the salt the fries. What? <laughs> I'm gonna go look. No way. <laughs> they have a picture of the what? Sorry, I missed the last word. I need to go find which one. The 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 box with with the quote unquote salt surprise, as if you know, <laughs> as if set by some notable sage. Where is that? <laughs> I, I must was, have I'm it. I'm trying to find that reply, and I can't find it. <clears throat> All right, shall we continue? Yes. Um, I have so many questions. <laughs> uh, here's kind of a, a mixed bag question. I mean, as for as in for everyone, but it's specifically um, what was the idea behind Shodan and giving her that specific great voice? And that question's from uh, Imuni. Um, the, the question is, what was behind Shodan's what, voice? Yeah, the idea behind her voice. Um, well, I, I, the voice acting part that I did is really just a small part of what uh, Shodan is. And so originally, um, Greg LaPiccolo um, uh, would take the lines that I said. I hesitate to even call the Shodan lines that I do voice acting because really my job is just to speak at uh, clearly and um, at a fairly steady pace with a little bit of inflection occasionally. But then Greg would take the lines and for for each Shodan line, um, I he, it would take several hours of him chopping it up very um uh, in a very particular way i think he would make judgment calls about whether this particular word made shodan angry um and how she might show her discomfort or anger um um you know by stuttering or or, or getting loud or or going really low in pitch uh, so none of that i did uh, so that was all Greg and then later Eric. Um, and uh, so I don't know um, where exactly they got the sound design for it, but I'm, I'm sure that um, some movie computers uh, like like Hal um, somewhere. But she does seem yeah. unique. Well, there was there was definitely kind of a trope at the time about about that kind of speech pattern for for glitchy AI, um, and I know, like, I'm sure this is not the only example of it, but I know at least one thing that that, that I remember came came up in in the design of that was uh, was that uh, that show Max Headroom from the '80s. Oh yes, I remember that show. Yep, he was very glitchy, but but friendly. He was nice. <laughs> <laughs> 
this and there's like, actually discussion about uh, Shodan being male or female, uh, because sometimes we refer to her as her, but in the old text there is calling it him, so I, I, I think people are asking about that in the history of that. Yeah, Shodan, Shodan was, was, I think, you know, in, in that, that sort of unfortunate way that the, that the default picture of a character is male unless someone says otherwise, like, you know, we kind of sort of assumed or thought of Shodan as male until it came time to do the the, the audio design for the for the for the voice version of everything, um, and that that was when that was actually when Shodan like, acquired a gender was was when was when she needed a voice. Well, did was I hired because it it was decided that Shodan was female, or was Greg just trying out my voice and then it was decided, yeah, let's go in this direction. I really don't know which way. It was. I've talked to Austin and Doug about that, and they were they were pretty clear that it was they wanted a female antagonist. I have. Um, think, oh, sorry. I think they and they loved tribe as as anyone with any sense would. So. <laughs> <clears throat> I have. I think um, you got the job that way. I'm yeah, sure. that makes sense. I have. Yeah, because... um, oh, sorry. Sorry, people keep breaking off. Sorry. That's okay. I, th I mean, Greg knew my voice not only because we had been in tribe for years, but we had also lived in a communal house for years. So he must have um, thought that I was the ideal female villain, I guess. So thanks, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the things about, about Shodan's voice is, is I, you know, I, it may just be my imagination. I've never actually talked to anybody about it, but it seems to me that as the game goes on, that's worse as she kind of <laughs> loses it I, I think that's true you know about that I, I, I in fact I seem to remember Greg commenting on that specifically it's subtle but it sure yeah. worked it'd actually be good for that is uh, it was a while ago now but uh, remember uh, years ago now uh, Matthew Weiss uh, when he was at, at MIT at the game lab did a did a podcast series with a bunch of of, of of uh, Looking Glass folks, and I'm pretty sure that one of them was was Greg, and they talked specifically, like really deep dive on on some of those on some of the. You know the the other thing. Uh, needless to say, Shodan's going to come back in System Shock Three, right? I mean, she kind of has to, and um, I, I have. Uh, and an audio guy who's doing the voice processing uh, with with Greg and Eric on that and the amount of work that went into that I mean Terry kind of mentioned that but it's it's astonishing how much hand editing goes into making Shodan as terrifying as she is it's way more work after ever My part just takes a few seconds per line, but then hours of work editing um, uh, to, to make them, you know, terrifying and, uh, you know, um, menacing and um, jumbled and it's, it's crazy. So yeah, um, <clears throat> sort of going back to the um, previous uh, question, I uh, I'm quite proud of this, but I actually have a piece of art that was hung up on the uh, walls of Looking Glass Studios itself. It's uh, I've mentioned it to Rob uh, multiple times. He's probably sick of me talking it talking about it, but um, it's a painting of uh, the hacker uh, versus a very male-looking showdown with a um, I think it's a cyborg drone. Um, stood ready to fire, and um, it's just my most favorite piece of art that I have. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, n I never hesitate to bring that up. When I um, came in to record Shodan, I remember Greg playing for me that they did have a male test voice on a couple of those lines. So I feel like somebody tested some male actor or somebody, maybe just a placeholder, uh, one of the member of the team did placehold record some of those first showdown lines. 
Oh, I would about kill to hear that, you know? <laughs> I, I want to say it was Austin Grossman's voice, but it was so long ago. I'm not sure. Maybe Tim remembers? No. Uh, Daniel, some people want to see uh, <laughs> that uh, art piece you're talking about. Maybe you can post it up on Discord later. Yeah, I will do. I was going to say, this hook up on the wall, I, I, I'm not going to go and get it and try and show it off in front of the, <laughs> the, the webcam that I yeah. have, but I will post take a picture, picture of it. Me. Yes, and I also have, uh, I think it was Rob who actually sent it to me, and you sent me a copy of the book as well, Rob. Um, so thank you for that. I don't remember. I'm actually, uh, <laughs> I have a piece of original Rob Waters art. Uh, was it the Gore Tiger? Is that what it was called? What tiger? Oh, the gorilla Gore tiger. tiger. The gorilla tiger. Yeah. yeah I have I have uh, an original piece of artwork of that. Nice. Yeah. When I love that thing. The owl bear of systems. Um, when Looking Glass like went chapter 11 and I kind of I think I, I had left I think I was at a rational at the time but a friend let me in and I basically went in the night before I think the doors were going to get closed and I ripped all my art off the wall <laughs> excellent <laughs> and took it home <clears throat> a little <laughs> oh did you guys really, did you guys ever think that, uh, like, uh, w while you were making System Shock, that you'd think, man, 25 years later, I'm going to be talking about this game again, and how many, so many people love it, and uh, did you ever possibly imagine that that would happen? Probably not, but... Uh... No, not in the least. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm good online sitting on uh, Greg's... Um, like couch in his apartment because there was no way to record there was no you know quiet room at uh, Looking Glass to do any recording and <laughs> it never occurred to me that I'd be talking about this uh, 25 years later uh, uh, the, uh, the idea that, that people still care edible. I mean this and I mean Deus Ex is 20 years old now and, and System Shock 25 years old it's Although I, I, I will say, I remember at, at Origin there was, I, I can't speak for Looking Glass, honestly, but at Origin, there was always this feeling like like we were we were going to change the world. Uh, you know, I mean, not us individually, but, you know, video games were, were going to change the world. And well, we, we kind of did, you know, uh, which is kind of cool. In game, I'm not talking about that, but just as a as a medium the world is different because of the stuff we were all doing you know 20 25 years ago which is pretty gratifying actually this very 9 inch nails sounding reactor music Theme, the I have the a music in System you. Shock is great. Mm, some real bangers in there. <laughs> sorry, Please, someone. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Randy asks: um, Is VR still planned for uh, System Shock Enhanced Edition Source? Boop boop boop. Uh, was that a question for Steve? Yeah. Steve. Wakey, wakey. I heard it, but I don't have an answer. New Atlanta to Steve. <laughs> it's now up to Terry. Terry will decide. <laughs> we we oh, could no, make was... something up and commit night dive to something. That would be fun. Oh, <laughs> Confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> probably thought he could leave for a few minutes without anyone knowing. Oh boy, okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask a different question. Let me go back to my list. <laughs> Pretend this never happened.
And I apologize. My cat wants attention right now. Hmm. So he is bugging me. There are so many VR questions. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we supported VR in System Shock. <clears throat> oh yeah. The the Forte VFX one and the Cybermax. Uh, which I always called the Cyber Brick because it weighed about forty pounds. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Funny story, I forget which of those uh, which of those headsets it was, but uh but it turns out that uh, Karthik Bala, who was who was one of the, the co-founders of Vicarious Visions, would, I would then go on to work at that studio after Liquid Bots. At the at the time of System Shock, he was like interning at one of these one of these like early early generation VR headset companies, and he actually he actually worked on on uh, on some of the some of the hardware that we were working with. So small world. It wasn't a System Shock uh, story, but. Um... When, when we were working on System Shock, at the same time I was working with a team on a game called uh, Wings of Glory, which was a World War I flight sim. And there was one of my testers on Wings of Glory was, was testing it with the Cybermax. And uh, it caught on fire while he was wearing it. It got <laughs> so hot. Wow. We had, to, we had to rip it off his head before his head went up in flames. That is scary. The world wasn't quite ready for VR back then. Wow. Hopefully we don't catch on fire now. <laughs> I mean, the and System Shock was, it was interesting playing in, in VR, but the uh, the optics were so bad and the resolution was so bad. It was, it was a little tough. It, it didn't, it, it wasn't a great experience, but we supported it. I do love this trap room. I thought I could outsmart the trap room the other day by destroying all the cameras, but then somebody somebody on the game dev team had an answer for that going, oh, destroy the cameras, well, I'm going to activate this trap anyway and screw you over. <laughs> I thought that was genius. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that was <laughs> I have a question uh, that is uh, kind of regarding System Shock 3. Are you okay if I ask it? I don't know if like you don't want to spoil too much. Uh, you, you dropped out again. I didn't hear the question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, I have a question that is in regards to System Shock 3, but I, if you don't okay. want to answer it, you don't want to spoil anything, uh, I'll ask it and you can decide if you want to answer it. It says, uh, okay. will any characters from System Shock 1 be making their way back into System Shock 3 that can be talked about? Um. Interesting question. Do I want to answer that? <laughs> it's uh, all up to you. Let's just say that that some questions will be answered. Ooh. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm excited. I don't want to say any more than that. All right. We will respect the, the element of surprise of playing. Why am I running around when I could just roller skate around the station? Uh, yeah, Daniel, why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right, because then I get shot by hoppers. Ouch. Um, here's... Uh, a question because we kind of briefly talked about uh, this topic. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce the the last name because I'm bad at that. Uh, why is Abe uh, Geron's head needed for the retina scan so smiling so devilishly? <laughs> is he smiling? Apparently he's smiling. Maybe Rob does. Yeah, I recall. I think that was either, for whatever reason, um, let's see. It was either, was that, it, it could have been Mark LeBlanc's head that I made smiling, or 
um, programmers. I can't think of his name. Who is the? Hey Tim, who is the programmer that I can't remember his name, but he he had black hair. It was kind of long and back in a ponytail, and I think he wrote you're, a. You're thinking about it there. Yeah, Abe, Abe Garrett, I'm pretty sure was John. Oh yeah, yeah, he wrote a motorcycle. Uh, John. Yeah, it was John. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, on his computer, he had like the rear view mirrors from his motorcycle. Yeah. I don't know. I think I made him smiling for some reason. I forget why. According to uh, the uh, System Shock Wikipedia page, Abe Guerin was, in fact, John Mayer. That's useful to know. Players Thank and fans know media. so much more about our games than we do. It's mm -hmm. incredible. One of the Shodempedia uh, people is actually watching right now, so they can get some more info. You know more about our games than we do. Congratulations. <laughs> Oh wow! Now, now I'm looking at uh, Adrian's entry on Shodanpedia from a. They've got a like a an upresed version of the portrait, <laughs> and you know it, they didn't actually have access to the original higher resolution photo, and so they've just sort of done their best, and it, it ends up looking to me like a like a police sketch artist version of John Mayer. It's like, you know, <laughs> kind of, kind of close. I assume that was from like one of the, the high res green masters. The Mac version, I think, had a lot of high res uh, art. Uh... So, probably from that one. Can I survive Shodan's trap? Let's find out. Doing incredibly well, by the way. <laughs> That's why we have master. <laughs> Just barely survived. Uh, here's a question. Was there other mini games? Uh, planned but scrapped because of time. Ooh, I don't remember. I, there were, there, I mean, there were some that like that almost didn't make it in, and and uh, or that had issues for one or another. Like one of one of the things I ended up doing was was going in and and, and doing some uh, some finish work on a bunch of the a bunch of the mini games either because like. Sometimes just because, like, to, to avoid like legal issues with, with, uh, uh, you know, we were we were cutting some of our homages a little close. So, like, you know, I had to go in and, and turn turn missile command upside down and turn into eel zapper and stuff. But um, hmm. I don't remember any that we just like that we that we left on the table though. Uh, here's a question for Terry. Do you have an opinion on GLaDOS? Um, I can't remember what GLaDOS is. <laughs> well, actually, anyone can an jump in and answer this, too, if they want to. Uh, she's the AI from Portal. I and think that very was much feels inspired. <laughs> I think that was Oh, my good. God. <laughs> it's a very showed an like answer, actually. The kick GLaDOS's butt? You know? <laughs> call out. It's a rumble. Yeah, that... No, I think Shodan would take the 
take the the situation more seriously, you know? It would be a very different top. game. GLaDOS Somebody's got to flip that for sure. Doesn't GLaDOS, like, promise you cake at one point? I would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember seeing a shirt. It was a custom-made shirt. It had, uh, it was around a poker table, and it had uh, Shodan, it had GLaDOS, and it had Am from I Have No Mouth and I'm a Scream, all playing poker. Oh, my God. It was great. I should have got one. <laughs> Hmm, I'd be in trouble here. Any more questions? There are so many. I'm just sorting through them <laughs> and seeing. Some of them are very long, and some of them are kind of already answered, so they're not really worth asking because it's so slightly different. Um, and there's a lot of music questions. But I, I don't know how you guys feel about answering uh, questions about the music. Uh, that was really Greg's department, but I don't know, Terry. You might have you might remember some of some of uh, what his process uh, or not. Uh, you know, at the, at that time, I wasn't there, um, so I would I wouldn't feel comfortable answering for Greg. I, I do know that. Um, uh, before Greg and Eric, uh, and you can correct me, Tim and Norman, if I'm wrong, but uh, there was no audio department, really. So, that, um, that is... yeah, so, um, I mean, they... Dan, Dan Schmidt and, and Seamus Blackley did like all the music in Underworld and Underworld Ascendant, if I remember correctly. There was definitely no, no audio department, yeah. So um, it, it took years to build a department up from a gaming company that had been getting away without an audio department. I think that there, you know, it took a little longer uh, than Greg wanted, but, um, you know, by the time Looking Glass was done, they had, um, you know, recording equipment. All the actors could come into Looking Glass and, you know, completely soundproof studio and um you know there were several employees working on sound effects and um you know hiring uh, voice actors and and they would still sometimes recruit voice actors from the looking glass employees um they started to recruit only the uh. best of voice actors like like daniel thron question necessary. Oh yeah, I should let that death animation play out. Go on, shoot me. Let me play and you'll see it plenty. <laughs> <laughs> It's such a great sequence, I love that. He looks like a character from Babylon 5 after his head's been sucked in. <laughs> Who am I thinking of? I, you might see some of that in System Shock 3 too. <laughs> One one question that I saw uh, quite early in the in the uh, the, the Twitch chat um, that I thought was interesting, uh, you know, interesting enough to remember. Uh, someone was asking about the uh, the placement of the uh, the assassin cyborg, um, and uh, and certainly like I, I have, having done a, a bunch of that myself, like I, I I thought it was really interesting, like the way those guys ended up working. Um, like, there's actually very little game mechanically to them to make them such effective assassins, right? Like, they don't really have much in the way of, of any special powers. It's just that, 
Like normally when you do a character design, one of the main things you're trying to do is give them a really clear and readable silhouette. And the assassin cyborg goes completely the other way. And it's just in its character design. And then in terms of audio, like they were the only character in the game that didn't have a little alert bark when they saw you. And so there wouldn't be any warning before they started shooting at you. Um, and aside from that, it was all placement. It was just like, it was all level design and how they were put in, in effective ambush points. Um, and so, you know, I mean, we didn't really have a lot to work with because it was, you know, the 1990s. Um, but I've always, I was always thought it was really interesting, like how we were able to realize that concept, um, you know, with very little sort of like game mechanically to, to back it up. But yeah, the, the, the assassin cyborg who's hiding in the drop ceiling on level seven, that was. Oh yeah, that one. Alright, I'm going through my list again. Someone is asking if the video overlays were hard to implement. <clears throat> Afraid I don't remember. It's, uh, that's too far back for me. Someone's asking, did you have a plan to add vending machines in the original game? I saw some cut textures of these objects. Wow, I hope not. I don't think so. I think so. I mean, a lot of that is just, uh, you know, there were, there's a, a number of, of concepts for textures. Um, and, you know, part of, part of that, right, is like you want the, you want the place to look like a, like a working space station. But at the same time, like you don't want, you don't want elements that look like they, sh you should be able to interact with them that you can't. Right. And so, there's this sort of fine line in terms of in terms of texture design and the way that the that the station was dressed to get the look that we wanted, but make sure that it was like as clear as possible, like what was and was not like a you know a, an object versus just a texture. Um, and I I suspect that 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 uh, that sort of thing might have just been a, a you know like a, a casualty of that process where you know it it just. It was something that that kind of promised something that it couldn't deliver, and it was getting used for that reason. That's but actually I, still a that that's still a big problem today. Actually, so the like if you if you put a telephone in a scene, people are going to expect it to work like a telephone, oh, right? For sure. Live up to that promise. It's just going to drag people out of the experience. So uh, we have knock down drag out arguments about whether you know that object should be usable and if it's not usable should it be in the game at all the real interesting dilemma we were we were having that discussion uh, last week uh, on the system shock 3 team because i wanted a lot more things to be interactive um than was probably reasonable and so then the question is do we put things in sort of contextually appropriate even if you can't interact with them uh, or do you leave them out and worry less about like a working space station like Tim just said it's uh, it's still a problem yeah I feel like we have have a, a bit more of a media language now where like where there's con there's conventions to sort of to signal players you know which which things are and are not um, you know, working parts of the scene, but um, you know more so than we did 25 years ago. Um, but it, 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 you know, that's that's still not saying much. It's definitely still a big problem. I'm hearing your voice. I'm having kind of flashbacks to when we worked together <laughs> so closely on the Thief games. Oh my goodness. You were talking about the audio department uh, at Looking Glass before. Think how, think how critical audio was to Thief. Doing a Thief game without 
basically the best audio department in the business. Oh yeah. Well, by that time, you know, that was the point at which we had, you know, a, a, a especially for like the kind of, of of independent development studio we were. We had quite a good, you know, in-house audio department and audio production studio. Uh, you know, uh, and Terry mentioned the the the, um, the the sound facilities, but you know, there was also like this came up just recently, like this little like there was a little green screen like studio there and everything that. That was part of the development of the, the cutscenes on Thief, and, and uh, yeah, Living Glass really committed to the AV department, ultimately. Um, so I have a question that pretty much anyone can answer, um, and I don't know how aware of specific mods uh, you know, or up if you're into the mod scene of System Shock at all. But a question's asking if you, anyone has a like a favorite mod that was made off the game. And Danny, you can answer this too. Yeah, I've I've only played some, but um, mm -hmm. I mean certainly like even among the among I guess like sort of this was a while ago, right? But like when when people were first first modding it just for like higher graphics fidelity and for for some you know, modernization of some of the issues that we were complaining about earlier in terms of the UI UX. Um, like that, that alone, I think, uh, was, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was really refreshing for me to go back and play the game just like, you know, um, and, uh, and have those changes. But, um, but yeah, aside from that, like I have not really kept up with, uh, with, with much of, of uh, what the, what the mods have been doing. Can I be really cheap and say the mouse look mod? <laughs> yeah. Mouse look alone was you. You can say whatever you want. Sweet health will be mine. Or against those cameras, I'll tell you. Hmm. <laughs> oh, security's still too high. Uh, here's a question asking if you guys are excited to see uh, what becomes of our System Shock uh, remake, or what part you're excited for to see, you know, done more modernly. Yeah, I'm, well, I mean... I'm really looking forward to it. Um, you know, one actually one thing that that I hadn't thought about before, but that that came up a little early in the discussion is. Uh, you know, Rob was was uh, chafing about the, the limitations of of his his concept for those for those final levels, and I, you know I think a lot of that limitation was technical, and so so seeing how how that concept could be realized uh, these days, um, I think that'll be really cool. You know, I'm just looking forward to, to having it. seeing how it could look. I've, I've been saying for years that, it, and this is kind of sad and pathetic, but if you took Underworld and System Shock, gave them modern graphics and updated the sound and fixed the UI, you are at video games. <laughs> yeah, you know, I so I'm, I'm just looking forward to, to seeing it the way we probably all imagined it in 1994. This is, I actually have a question that um, I don't think maybe anybody here will have an answer to, but do, do any of, um, does anybody here know about the game Deep Cover that was in the works uh, at the time at Lucky Glass before they, uh, they closed? Uh, just a little. Is that as much as you know? Should I fill in? <laughs> Any info uh, that you have would be really cool to know because I've been dying to know because from what I could gather, it was a thief meets System Shock meets James Bond, which sounds really cool. Yeah, it, so it was, you know, I, I was not on that team at the time. I was working on, on uh, the, the, the prototyping team for, 
for the for the the C three that didn't happen. Mm. Um, but uh, like the basic idea was, it was a it was a, like a a sort of a like a nineteen sixties period piece in a, in like an espionage genre. Uh, so um, you know, taking some of the obviously like there's some similarities there to to what we did in Thief and in that kind of like you know, like by by genre. Um, but uh, yeah, just like getting getting a little farther away from like the super well trodden uh, territory of like fantasy and sci fi, I, I I'm sort of still kind of regret that that never happened. I just remember people asking me if I could do a, a Russian accent. I think that was for that game. Is that <laughs> right, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So can you? <laughs> <laughs> Boris, what Go we ahead. do about moose and, and squirrel? Yeah, that's what I. Uh, Boris, what we do about moose and squirrel? <laughs> <laughs> we call that version System Shock Ski. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Um, here's a question um, about the number puzzles. Who came up with the number of puzzles on the seat? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, who came up with the number puzzles on the CPUs? Oh, so there, so there were there were like two hardware hacking puzzles in. In, in the in system talk, right? There's the there's the the, uh, the sort of like grid one, and the uh, the the colored wire patching one, um, and uh, the, uh, the 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 wire patching one, which I, I kind of feel like is, is the is the better one, but I would um, <laughs> I, that, that was Doug, um, and the the. The grid puzzle was something that that uh, that was that was that was me, and we sort of like just we we felt like like we wanted to have another type of puzzle, um, and I like those too. But but I, I really like the sort of like the way that uh, the way that the wire puzzles kind of lend themselves to sort of an intuitive approach of like feeling your way through. Um, but yeah, that's and that's I know that one thing about that is that uh, that 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 Doug uh, was part of the. Like the MIT hacker community, and he was, you know, he was uh, like a hobby, you know, kind of like lock picker and and such. And so, I think some of that that element of finesse in lock picking was one of the things that he was going for in that puzzle design. Um, and I, I, I definitely I get that feel from it. Isn't it a requirement at MIT that you learn how to pick locks? <laughs> it's pretty common. Yeah, I, managed I to, have a programmer yeah, on my little... team now who's for, who graduated from MIT, and she keeps her lock picks right on her desk, <laughs> just in case somebody needs them. Nice. I have always wanted to learn to do that myself, to be honest. It's, I mean, it's a real engineer's kind of hobby, right? So. I was working out the texture today. What was that? I'm sorry, I kind of interrupted. I was just saying I, I was revamping that texture today, the, the one we just saw in the hallway. Hmm. Ah, I guess you should in. Don't be rude, she's in chat. <laughs> Uh, here's uh, kind of an interesting technical question, uh, or kind of technical. Uh, System Shock has some of the most dense and intricate maps I have ever seen in a game. What were some of the design and technical challenges that came from that, and how did you keep track of everything? Oh. Uh, so one of the biggest challenges there is, is, is was sort of like achieving that with the with the engine at the time right? it was a it was a big step up from what we had on the underworld games but 
uh, you know, fundamentally, it still is all laid out on a on a on a tile grid. You know, each of these, you know, sort of you know, look like maybe a meter and a half square kind of spaces. Is is uh, it's just like a, a tile type with elevation and then sometimes a slope and um, uh, and so like um, it, it it took a you know a certain amount of of inventiveness just to like get uh, sort of the the intricacy of of, of of architecture that that we were going for here, um, and then you know a, a lot of times like um, you know there's some tricks involved there as well, right? With like having having uh, having spaces where like you you place you know, we had a limited ability to place bridges right where where we were able to to cross some spaces over each other and such, but um, um, so that was part of it, and also just like you know to get the feel of a space station. Uh, you know, as opposed to what we had done previously on Underworld, like on the, in a like a fantasy dungeon, it's okay to leave all kinds of dead space in your map, right? But you know, you you can't have a lot of like sort of like space in in Citadel Station that reads as solid stone, right? You want it to be accounted for, and that sort of like drove us in this direction of like of using using all the available space and having everything like sort of like crammed in on on other spaces. That led to again to like this kind of intricacy of design. Um, so just it was it was a variety of sort of like different constraints that were pushing us towards towards the, the end result here. We want to go back and play again. That remaster better come out soon. I know, right? <laughs> I've, had, I've had enough time to mostly forget it, so it'll be good. It'll be a exactly. Like even even the levels that I did, I expect to sort of surprise myself. Like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> now I remember what I did. <laughs> I'm looking forward. To So we're approaching almost two hours now. Um, do we want to do a few more questions, wrap things up? How are you guys doing on your own personal? Yeah, I, I think I need to be done pretty soon. I don't know about everyone. <laughs> I mean, two hours is, you know, though it's been fun. Oh, it's, it's definitely a pleasure, but, you know, there's a limit. <laughs> you have games to make. <laughs> I'm happy I got to the nice jump human room. Oh, good. Um, so let me let me look at a few more questions, and then uh, we can wrap it up once we officially hit that two-hour mark. We're almost there. Um, so did you guys ever consider multiplayer for System Shock 1, and do you think you'll do multiplayer for System Shock 3? Uh, <laughs> there... There was certainly no discussion of multiplayer for System Shock 1 that I was a part of. Let's put it that way. If it happened, people weren't talking to me about it. And as far as multiplayer in general goes, I think it's next logical step for immersive simulations. You know, somebody's going to do it and get it right. Who that is, who knows? All right, it's a race. But we'll somebody, somebody's going to do that at some point. <laughs> there was a multiplayer version of uh, in mode in System Shock 2, but I was not there for that. But my understanding was it went in really late and was, was almost an afterthought. Oh, We're yeah. hoping to help clean that too. up. That multiplayer in System Shock 2 was a tactical nightmare. I mean, I, again, I wasn't on the team, but you couldn't help it. But... but but understand what they went through. Um, but it worked, like, from a from a play player's perspective, it worked much better than I kind of had any right to, since it, given that it wasn't part of the original design. Yeah, that's that's actually one area where I think the, uh, the, the uh, you know, some of the, the 
options for player specialization really helped it because you know it let it let different players in the multiplayer take on really distinct roles. So that was that was a pleasant surprise. We did uh, in the Deus Ex Game of the Year edition. We did um, air mode. It was all deathmatch kind of stuff, but it was just I was I was curious to see if all of the the um, character customization and unique play style uh, abilities would would make the multiplayer experience feel different than than other games work you know so i think there's a lot of potential there that that's just waiting for someone to uh, i mean most most i don't want to say most games a lot of games are just you know move forward forward like a shark and kill everything that moves and There are more interesting things you could do in multiplayer than that. Um, here's one question. Uh, kind of in regards to System Shock 3, but not fully. Uh, what's your favorite part about revisiting the Shock universe now? Uh, well, it's got to be Shodan. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, she, she's a great character. Uh, we're we're looking to do some interesting things with her, um, so it, it's it's probably getting to getting to play around with Shodan again. Yeah, I'm, I'm just not going to be... say any more than that. I'm thrilled to be able to continue to play Shodan again. I do have one quick story, although it would be a little odd. It, I had read. Um, a design somewhere a couple of years ago had was complaining about the Shodan character and, and his complaint was that I had full artistic control over her and wouldn't allow her to do anything and I was just reading it going wow I do? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had no idea um, you know whoever wrote the article didn't contact me to verify that it was true but at any rate I do not have full artistic control over Shodan I am just a little bit easy as well oh if you if you have something to say about Shodan it it counts for a lot Terry <laughs> it does I mean not full creative control maybe but yeah well. as well as anybody thanks Warren <laughs> I have one, a question for Tim regarding Thief, if you're interested in answering that. Um, it, someone wants to know, what was your take on the 2014 Thief game, and what would you like to see from Thief in the future, or a spiritual successor to it? Ah, uh, so I actually, uh, I, I have to say, I... I, I, I so much didn't want to answer this question that I avoided playing the 2014 theme so, <laughs> so that I wouldn't have to answer it. Um, I hear things about it, but that's about it. Um, in terms of, of uh, um, the other part of the question, though, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Like, um, the, the, the thing about, the thing about those, those kinds of games, right? So much of it is uh, is about you would call them stealth games, and that's that's certainly true, but it's not the whole truth. Um, to me, it's those games are more fundamentally about about uh, outwitting opponents, you know, and manipulating their behavior. Um, and you know, one one example of, of how you outwit them is is to is to conceal yourself. Right, but but misdirection and 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 you know and and um, and even even just like the the sort of like eavesdropping the narrative approach that we did in Thief, right? Like all of that is also part of that fantasy. Um, and I think there's there's just like such a still such a, a a broad opportunity there for the kinds of things you can do. Um, you know, especially like as as we continue getting more and more sophisticated AI. Um, and you know, I think a lot of effort in AI has been has been put to, you know, kind of like tactical decisions, um, 
because of the way that that the combat games you know are such a big part of the market um but uh so i think there's a lot of untapped potential there in terms of just like the kinds of the kinds of the kinds of behaviors that that are available and the the opportunities that that, that presents to to sort of like exercise a different kind of superiority and fantasy in the game you know by outwitting these characters so I, i'm just really interested to see where that's going to go Well, we just hit the two-hour mark. Uh, any parting words, last things you guys want to talk about? Or... Thank you for having us on. Really oh, pre- thank you guys for coming on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the great questions and, and for the enthusiasm about uh, about System Shock 25 years later. <laughs> yeah, um, if you guys have any... Um, <clears throat> social media handles that you want to share so people can follow you on uh, Twitter and the like. Now's your time to uh, share them with everybody. Mine, mine's uh, easy. I'm just at Tim Selmox on Twitter because there's not a lot of Tim Selmox. <laughs> and I'm Warren underscore, uh, Warren underscore Spectre. And uh, I'm just and happy uh, to be followed. And I'm just uh, Terry Brocious One, the number one. I don't think Terry Brocious was available, so I had to go with Terry Brocious One. (laughs) Um, I've got a lot more follows from uh, from this event. So thank. Awesome. Cool. Steve, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Oh, thank you. A ton of fun. Thank you. All right. Cool. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that one. Oh, he's gone. (laughs) Okay. All right. All right. (laughs) right. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Yep. Thanks for joining us. See you guys on the next stream. Next stream will be whenever. (laughs) See you guys later. Have a good evening. (laughs) Thank you.